Dude, I told All you, right. I'm, ready. I'm always ready. I'm ready for another episode of Bitcoin Q&A. We are back. It is Wednesday, September 27th. Hump day. Uh, I am Q. I'm joined by none other than A, also known as McShane. Uh, we're going to dive into some news from around the Bitcoin space in just a moment. And then, of course, we'll be answering some questions. But before we do that, make sure, if you are not yet already, please subscribe down below. We're talking about doing some exclusive streams on Zap.Stream or Rumble. So if you're not subscribed to one of those channels, please hop on over, search for Bitcoin Q&A, or as I like to call it, Bitcoin Quanda, uh, and make sure you subscribe to our channels there. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Just one thing before Take we get into the news. The screen real quick. And oh, you're good, you're good. Alex talk. No, 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 you're good. Um, we're up about 500 bucks from yesterday. This is on the back of uh, the ETFs being delayed. More more delays and uh, kind of deferred deferred judgment there. So I think I think the news is basically we're waiting until 2024 there might be a few more dates to look at in october but i would presume since you know arc and and the rest of the big ones got delayed they're probably going to across the board sweep these um and push them back into the final deadline so they have as much time as possible to prepare regulation and you know as soon as they let one of these bitcoin spot etfs through that opens the floodgates everyone will just refile to follow um you know, the strategy of the one that was let through. And if they don't allow, <clears throat> you know, a second or a third, they're going to get sued immediately. Uh, so will be interesting to see. Um, I guess in, in light of that news, just to go into it a little bit, Gary Gensler is also on trial today. Um, it's a hearing from the oversight of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So the Honorable Gary G., uh on trial today and i'm sure we'll be getting some clips that's happening right now so we'll be kind of getting some clips throughout the day of what what happens there but i'm sure he's just going to repackage um all of his statements from last time and just kind of sweep everything under the rug so i don't know what do you think about that q i think you're muted man Apologies. Thank you for that. Um, my big takeaway just as it pertains to the ETFs is in the grayscale decision where the judge found that grayscale should not be or is being unjustly denied their spot ETF. They cited the fact that there is a futures ETF that exists. And because the futures ETF exists, so too should a spot ETF. That doesn't rule out. And I'm going to shout out, uh, Joe Carlosari for this analysis, but that doesn't rule out the possibility for the SEC to retroactively actually go back and deny these futures ETFs. So that is with, within the realm of possibilities. Um, but to your point, yes, if any one of these ETFs gets approved, they all will. I just think it's. Can you, I think can you go into why they might do that? Why, why, why would they? Well, because uh, the judgment. Deny so the judgment of the grayscale suit essentially is validating the claim to have a spot ETF based on the fact that a futures ETF is in existence. So the SEC has within its okay. powers to just go back and retroactively retroactively say like, ooh, we made a bad call on that, so that's no more. And if the futures ETF essentially is deemed, hey, you know what? We shouldn't have this. Then the judgment in the grayscale case is a moot point because – the futures etf doesn't exist and the um basically the underlying theory here is that the futures market is being used to suppress the bitcoin price um shout out to our producer tino for pulling through uh a chart by willie Wu pointing to this fact this is very similar to the effect ftx had on the markets where you basically have an issuance of synthetic bitcoin flooding the markets um fulfilling demand that would otherwise send the price higher due to Bitcoin scarcity. So it, from a kind of fiat price perspective, I think it's really frustrating for some people who thought they'd have, you know, matching Lambos uh, to BitBoys by now. Um, you know, you've I've heard people make arguments that would be at like 400K right now if it weren't for the FTX and the futures market. I don't think I quite uh buy um, that much. Um, of price suppression, but I could certainly see the government using it as a tool. 
Um, but I could also just see it being an effect of a kind of messy system and it not well, being kind of a nefarious uh, conspiracy to attack Bitcoin. To to like kind of unpack what Willie was saying, because I read I read through some of his reports last night and he, he brings up a valid point in that the way this they've designed these um shoot i'm spacing on the word these derivatives of bitcoin because they're not like what willie's talking about isn't like oh you're just going on an exchange and and purchasing no it's like you're purchasing a futures contract for bitcoin and you're using cash as the collateral like you're creating this like marketplace for additional paper bitcoin and there's a way because the markets operate like this there's a way to essentially calculate out that hey you can push the price in a certain direction based on having a certain amount of leverage and a certain amount of active sort of buys or sells depending on the direction you want to push your price but i do think what's what is in the realm of possibilities and like the you could call it a conspiracy theory you could call it a thesis or whatever the thesis that i buy into a little bit more than it's the futures markets that's manipulating the price of bitcoin i really think it's just more simply put the leverage that some of these exchanges are offering because in bull markets and everyone is on i'm on 5x 10x 20 100x level whatever i'm on 100 leverage. i'm on 100x totally but like <laughs> in a bull market everyone is taking that long position for the most part and everyone thinks like oh i'm the only one taking this risk like no one else is doing it. like let me tell you everyone is taking it and unfortunately or fortunately someone has to take the other side of that trade and when the whole retail side wants to take one side of the trade it ends up being these exchanges that are stuck holding the other side of the trade and i'd be willing to bet a significant amount of money that the main reason why we didn't see six figure big i'm not talking we all have lambo i'm just talking 100k by conference day shout out matt odell like that was well within the cards but it was yeah. due to the leverage in the system that forced the exchanges to make sure the price didn't reach a certain amount because otherwise, based on all of the people who had five, they're 10, getting whatever, there, yeah. there would be there wouldn't be enough Bitcoin to go around. You literally couldn't have it go above a certain price because the amount of paper <laughs> Bitcoin that would have had if everyone cashed out all at once, there would have been more than 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. Well, that's just it. There are there 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 are all of these artificial Bitcoin that that people are derivatives. underwriting. Yeah, on paper the Bitcoin market. derivatives, whatever you want to call it. But like so, the reason they can exist you explain? Is I, I was just gonna say, can you explain a little bit, maybe in a little bit more technical detail, just how that actually affects the price? Like how all these, um, you know, leveraged long. How does that affect? Just, just, just one more time, so it's abundantly clear to people why the exchanges kind of de-risk for this scenario and take totally why they end up holding the bag. Why this often high leverage environment exposes holes in their balance sheets and blows up funds. And so, I'm going to do this to make the numbers really easy. But let's say you're just doing a fifty percent leverage trade. So you're going to put in a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, but in reality, you want to take, you want it to be able to absorb $150 worth of value. You would get liquidated if the value of this Bitcoin dropped by 50% down to $50 essentially. So that's a 50% leverage trade. The issue and what's going on is when McShane does his hundred X leverage on a thousand sats. That's not moving the market. But if 100,000 people all put one Bitcoin up and then they all have 2x leverage. So actually, I didn't. Then, yeah, 2x leverage would mean 50% decline. So yeah, you said 50%. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I realize that now. So 2x leverage. You want the price you're you're essentially saying you're putting in one bitcoin but you have two bitcoin in the marketplace that you get to play with and if bitcoin crashes by 50 percent, then you get fully liquidated but then what happens is okay now you have two bitcoin let's say it quadruples so now 
your original one Bitcoin investment is actually worth eight Bitcoin. Now, send that across that line of 100,000 people who also took the same trade as you. And now all of a sudden, instead of the exchange only being on the hook for an extra 100,000 Bitcoin because everyone put in one Bitcoin, the exchange is actually now on the hook for 700,000 Bitcoin because every mm -hmm. single person just 7x their stack. Now, mind you, you've got to return the one Bitcoin back to the exchange because that was the leverage trade and one of the Bitcoin was your own to begin with. But now all of a sudden you've right. essentially created, for, yeah. but you've created six Bitcoin essentially based on making this leverage trade, but not only Bitcoin were mined. The exchange didn't just magically mine all 600,000 Bitcoin or 700,000 Bitcoin that all of its customers on their balance, it says they made. So they either have to go and purchase this Bitcoin from some sort of a miner to fulfill that, or what I think is more likely is they take their own stack and are taking the opposite side of the trade. But for the bulls or bears to win and the price to move, it's essentially who has more on one side of the trade. Are there more people taking the bullish side, buying it and bidding the price higher? Or are there more this people- This would be the open interest. Yes. Or more people okay. selling, and if there, it's literally just like a, a net balance. If there's more buyers, yeah. price goes up in every market: gold, oil, stocks, bonds, Bitcoin. More buyers than sellers, price goes up. More sellers than buyers, the price goes down. So the exchanges are artificially creating this. There are more sellers because they hold the most Bitcoin. Remember last week we were talking about Coinbase, the largest Bitcoin uh, holder. They have almost 5% of supply. I mean, that's not theirs. Most of that is you retail not holding your own keys. But that goes to show you how much Bitcoin some of these exchanges actually have where they can manipulate and play with the market price. Well, game. So this Bitcoin, I mean, this problem only gets worse as adoption increases and more and more institutions start playing these games. But this is the futures market. So now how does the spot market solve for this i mean the spot the spot market itself is just pure no derivative no artificial bitcoin no creating right. bitcoin contracts to oh There's i no want bullshit. Yeah, yeah like it's just that the spot market it's is back. the 21 million supply cap derivatives right, markets right. futures markets all of that it's the equivalent of options trading it's like playing in a freaking casino totally dude i love playing fantasy football it's so much fun it is and i'm a lot better at playing fantasy football than i am at just like looking at the lines in vegas for a game and saying oh the team from la will win by a touchdown over the team from new york like i can't do that i can tell you though that quarterback's gonna have a good game on that team and that wide receiver is going to have a good game there and that running back is going to have a good game there no different than oh you know what i think in this window of time this stock is going to go up by this much so i'm going to buy this option i'm gonna i'm gonna sell this put option or i'm gonna buy this call option and i intentionally did them in reverse to see if you were paying attention there but but what no. you're saying is right now these institutions don't have a choice they're forced into somewhat precarious um positions if they want to hold bitcoin at all they're forced into this uh highly volatile futures market where they could no, just no, 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 do no. the um, more fiscally responsible thing of purchasing spot bitcoin if that were an option nobody's forced into this i think this is just a byproduct of the existing financial system and human well, beings uh, lack of engineering but they don't they don't have another option they don't have a, a spot option so, are you, are you speaking? Wait, hang on. Are you speaking specifically to an ETF or are you just speaking broadly to Bitcoin? Just because I was speaking broadly just to, to the Bitcoin. ETF. Pretend the okay. institutions are not allowed to hold Bitcoin. Okay, okay now the no, only then, option yes. they have to get yes. some exposure is the futures uh, and uh, these kind of like yes. leveraged instruments. No one's forcing them to take on all this leverage, but it just kind of incentivizes. I don't know. There's not, there's not a more ethical option there. I mean, I think over the course of the next 20 years, there will be a lot of, and I think there should be, 
this is going to be an unpopular opinion amongst Bitcoiners, but like, come, like, let's let's have a conversation. Shoot me a DM, tag me on uh, Noster or Twitter or wherever, and like, challenge me on this. But I think over the course of the next twenty years, at a certain point, it's going to be validated that MicroStrategy and Michael Saylor was maybe the only CEO who actually had his shareholders' best interests in mind by holding some of their treasury in Bitcoin. And then every other CEO in this generation right now either won't be a CEO by 2040 or will have been sued by Bitcoiners who are shareholders in these companies to essentially say, you had a fiduciary duty and you completely botched it by not holding some of your treasury in Bitcoin. And I, I think I think that will happen. I mean... That's that's how microstrategy starts to compete as... with BlackRock. By the way, that I have a whole theory on how microstrategy is actually on its on its way to becoming a BlackRock Vanguard esque financial institution. I full, firmly believe that. But to be fair, BlackRock has to put up four point five billion. That's it. That's you know. That's not chump change for them, but they could they could catch Sailor wait, at any moment wait, hang if they on. wanted to. You you with think a, that I'm gonna do the math really quickly in my head. I mean you it would send the price. Point, it would send the price up. They'd get no 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 point oh four percent of their assets under management. You think they would actually feel that? That's how what, that's what, what, what for what is their assets under ten trillion. right now? Ten yeah, that's trillion. what I'm saying. It's not it's it's not terribly unrealistic if they understood the value of this thing for them to purchase them the problem is by them purchasing that amount of bitcoin they can't compete with the price that sailor got in at i don't know his average price for bitcoin is like low twenty thousands, something like that maybe i think i think it's somewhere in the twenty thousands. but i mean there, there's i mean it's only four point it's only 4.5 billion, but it will push the price. And um, I'm just saying they could they can compete, but it's crazy that they're one of the only institutions, maybe a nation that could compete with MicroStrategy at this point if they wanted to. I think every every it's like Elon, BlackRock, Vanguard, US government, <laughs> uh, maybe a couple other governments if they uh, wanted to. Not saying they I will. I would say every single trillion dollar market cap company could like realistically, if Apple wanted to, if Tesla wanted to get back into this game, if um, Microsoft, even if Nvidia like wanted to allocate a portion of its treasury um, yeah. beyond that, look, I have a, I have a simple opinion on this, but I, I think it's laughable that Bitcoiners celebrate the idea of these big institutions getting involved because right. to your point, it's like, it's regular they regular will capture. push they will push the price up and then all of a sudden, like, yes, you and I got to front run these institutions before they pushed Bitcoin's price up, but that wasn't the point of Bitcoin. This wasn't a get rich quick scheme. This wasn't like, oh, I'm going to sit on my ass and let BlackRock come and make me rich. Like, on the contrary, this was supposed to be money for or a peer to peer transaction network for the entire world to be able to utilize, especially those who have been left out of the financial system and the banking system. And I think it. Yeah. I, I mean, we're going to see these narratives shift over the years because, like, as you're. As you're saying, that's not the that's not how it's turning out. It's turning out that the majority of Bitcoin is held in institutions and you know eventually captured by fully KYC. So you've got like a completely, you know, in some ways regulated, captured commodity. Um, the ones like us that hold it outside of all that are going to benefit i mean anyone who uses the bitcoin network will still benefit but the the, the problem is they're not going to have the same price point exposure so it i'm totally with you i think it's it's a complicated sentiment for maximalists it is a little bit inherently statist you're cheering you're cheering for the state and regulatory capture and i would contend that there's not that much of a difference between blackrock owning bitcoin and the u.s government owning bitcoin 
in the end. Have you, did you see how the U S government is planning on selling, I believe another 41,000 Bitcoin from its silk road? Um, yeah, yeah, they do this. They, they offload it. I mean, it's not much, but they, they have at least 200,000, um, mm -hmm. the last I checked. So they can, they can, they can flood the markets a little bit, but, um, I, I'm not worried about it, man. That's, that's great. I mean, Oh no, I'm not worried about it either. I'm trying to figure out how I can raise $25 million to go buy one of these trenches. <laughs> yeah. What, are, what, what do they, they auction it off, right? They auction it off. So my assumption is like, it would be a, a I believe it's either four twenty thousand, four ten thousand 10,000 Bitcoin tranches or four forty thousand, but for some reason, the 10,000 Bitcoin tranches seem more realistic, which would be, mm. it would cost you mark fair market value would be something to the tune of like $26 million right now. But again, my assumption is that this is a, a silent auction that you're going to pay under market value for. Dude. I mean, if Larry Fink and all the Uber rich people aren't just trying to get that arbitrage out of that, I, I don't know. I don't know why any, high net worth individual wouldn't be trying to take the arbitrage in that trade. Even if you can get it for a million dollar discount, you just made a million dollars. Well, talk about the general market sentiment because the, my, my macro chart boys are kind of going nuts at this stage. Um, even just outside of Bitcoin, you know, we're getting calls for a huge drop in the S and P got a lot of people saying, you know, it's a crap market. We've got other people saying we've got a, a bull market right around the corner. What do you think? And then we've got the argument that, look, we've been in a bull market all year. We've been in a bull market for the past 10 years. Everything's going to come crashing down. <laughs> where, where, where do you think we stand? Uh, I, I very much, I think I mentioned this to you, like I'm in the camp that we've had a bull market for the better part of this year. Um, I think we're in a little bit of a contraction period right now. Um, I think it'll depend on a few things. I very much am in the camp where I'm I'm still kind of expecting things to grind lower personally. Um, look, you have oil that's pushing almost hundred dollars a barrel right now. You have both markets who are pulling back, albeit like a necessary pullback. Um, by no means is this like a oh my god, run for the hills. Like, no, this is the market's gone up 20% for the year. It it could stand to cool down up to 10%. Um, if anyone's ever heard of like the Fibonacci retracement, you could literally see a market correction of, what is it? 38%, 50% or 62%. So by that logic, like you could see it you go down. 2000 level S and P. No, I, uh, the thing is I, the Fibonacci can sometimes be tricky, I tend to just use it on the most recent run. So here, let me pull up a chart. The like three, five would be the low of the last four. So then you would go three, ish. five to whatever the high. Three, three. And I think it was what, four or five. Oh, no, excuse me. We did dip down to, uh, yeah, of course, during COVID, we completely crashed out to. Uh, no, no, no. See, like that's you. No, you're, you're going way too far back. No, it just needs to be from like it, November just... of last year. Interesting. Like the, the most recent Get, 20 Getting into run. the astrology, folks. We're... <laughs> All right. I can't log into my own freaking... I can't log into any of these accounts right now because I'm on a new Wi-Fi network. So uh, I digress. But to be honest... Sponsorship like, opportunity. <laughs> yeah, dude, seriously. Uh, literally anyone trading view feel free to sponsor the show. Um, but I, I'm giving you the most non-answer answer, but it very much is just going to come down to, I think, some of these economic reports. I think we're going to get the Fed um, on their heels and they're going to have to play catch up, which is surprising. But I, I think we'll get another rate hike. I think we might even surprise and get two more rate hikes. Like that's I think within the realm of possibility because the labor market just is showing signs of weakness with like 
oh, unemployment's finally starting to show it's going up. It's like, yeah, because unemployment lags by months, not to mention most of the people unemployed were laid off. So then there was a severance period. So their unemployment data is actually not showing up in this. So we could literally see it also from takes a lot of. There's just like a lot of margin for error in some of this uh, data about unemployment that's released too, because you have people that are, maybe they're pursuing a better opportunity and actively looking for a job. They just happen to be unemployed at the time, you know? Maybe, I mean, it could be hordes of them. New entrants into the market. There, there's, there's also just like the BLS Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Their data has been wrong for the last year. Like, Every single one of their, oh, here's the report from the last month. Oh, and by the way, we're, we need to give a revision from the month before and we're revising it lower. Like every single labor or um, employment data has had to be revised lower. So that just goes to show you like either there's just pure incompetence and in the people who are handling this data that is then impacting hours and the world's monetary policy need to be replaced or this is like maliciously intended and there's something being covered up um i could see both possibilities but i do think it's just worth recognizing to your point like all of these numbers are skewed they're misrepresented and they're manipulated to make it look they don't account though. for the millions of new migrants <laughs> they don't account for the people like me who said fuck it and try to start their own business like you don't account for those types of statistics in just unemployment data got it got in fact, it in fact really all unemployment data is like that you can look at um confidently is this is the number of people who are collecting an unemployment check from the government that's really all that number gives you well let's uh let's turn the page here and hit our next story so the human rights foundation uh gifted 19 bitcoin over half a million dollars via its bitcoin development fund to support 15 different projects i think this is super important so you know i want to i want to list some of the uh the projects that received 25 and fifty thousand dollar payouts um We've got a developer called Fursi who I was unfamiliar with. I'm excited to kind of read what what he's been he's been working on. He's got about 20 repositories out there on GitHub, so I'm, I'm excited to dig into those. Um, next, with another 50,000 grant, we've got Summer of Bitcoin. Uh, they have an incredible summer fellowship program. Um, in this year, they had more than 10,000 af uh, applicants to their program from 70 countries. So really good work by them. Um, Gerald Rod, another developer uh, working on Bitcoin Core. Um, he's using the funding to review pull requests and fix bugs and uh, expand developer education, improve the Bitcoin Core app, and um, yeah, help bring full nodes to mobile phones. So super important work. Very happy to see him win. Um, there's another... Uh, Another grantee, Vintium Org. Uh, this is an organization that is expanding open source Bitcoin work in Latin America and Brazil. Shout out to them. $50,000 went to Guy Deer or G Deer. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce that with uh, his work on lightning native stable coins in Bitcoin Core. Um, his stable coins use or the, the proposition uses discrete log contracts to reduce counterparty risk and maximize decentralization. So kind of exciting, um, if not somewhat controversial work. $50,000 to the Kawakibi Foundation uh, to build a Mina Bitcoin hub. This is going to activate, uh, educate activists, journalists, nonprofits on using Bitcoin to transact freely and receive international donations and hold their money securely and privately. Um, Number seven to Justin Mueller or Mueller for his work on Fediment. We've had a lot of support for Fediment over the years. I guess I would um, stop, you know, like ridiculous sums of money raised. They have a really cool website. But I'm curious, Q, have you ever 
used uh, Fediment, or do you have any any interest in it? I have uh, I have not used Fediment. Um, I understand roughly um, why it exists and what it's helpful and the problem it solves, um, but I I personally don't need to use Bitcoin in that way at this moment in time. Um, yeah. Nor nor do I intend to, quite honestly, because I I feel more comfortable custodying my own Bitcoin, and then as a result, like I don't feel like I need to then have sort of a, a I forget what they call it. Like I know it's, it's not like, like a trustless a, community bank, basically. Yeah, like it, it's essentially it's an option for if you don't want don't want to or are unable to self custody yourself. Um, that's the simplest yeah. way I look at it. Yeah. So his uh, his work is focused on implementing a database migration mechanism to allow um, what they call guardians to upgrade their Fediment servers seamlessly. So excited to see what comes of that. I mean, the hype is real, uh, but to be honest, it's also one of those things that maybe it's just from my, I guess, uh, financial privilege or my perspective. I don't quite understand. Um, so I'll have to dig more into Fediment on another show, but. Another grant I was really excited to see D plus uh, plus good friend get twenty five thousand dollars for her educational initiatives. Um, she has a free Bitcoin boot camp and is using the funds to continue her international education um, and maintaining uh, Bitcoin core and uh, free and open source uh, projects. If you've never heard her speak, she's going to be at Bitcoin Amsterdam delivering a huge keynote uh 101 to bring everyone up to speed right before the conference so we're really excited about that and if you've never heard her speak she's one of the best educational voices like one of the most patient people you'll ever encounter that can just walk you through basically any aspect of bitcoin it's it's kind of amazing i mean i used to spend hours listening to her and a few others talk on uh clubhouse every day just educating complete noobs um just with incredible patience and just donating all of their time so it's really exciting to see people like that win um and shout out 25,000 sessions go ahead i was just gonna quickly yeah, yeah. Shout out btc sessions we'll get there yeah we'll get to him he he got a grant as well um of course for his internationally renowned education and videos um i mean this guy's just a monster he's the best best workshop like technical workshop giver ever films these i've seen him do them live and it's just it's just amazing he's he's his educational materials are basically invaluable to the community. I mean, people are referencing them daily to learn how to self custody their Bitcoin and do other really cool things. And now even Nostra, he's moved into Nostra and educating people about that. So we've got a uh, Bitcoin Akazi building a circular economy in South Africa. They received twenty five thousand um, dollars. Amitzi for her work on Bitcoin uh, me mentorship and Bitcoin bytes, and uh, these will. Funds will support her as she mentors Bitcoin core developers and uh, works to improve the the privacy and security of Bitcoin nodes. Uh, I've got just a couple more here. La Liberia, they Bitcoin um, to make the technical education accessible to as many Spanish speaking Bitcoiners as possible. Um, 10,000 in travel grants to TabConf, which is a really exciting technical Bitcoin conference that takes place in Atlanta, Georgia. So this is going to help just expand. I mean, really, you can tell the focus of these grants is just international, extremely targeted, um, really helping building a strong network globally. So excited to see that for TabConf. SatsConf is another huge conference in Brazil that's coming up, more travel grants additional travel grants to Bitcoin plus plus, which I believe takes place in Austin. Um, I think this is nifty nays conference and they're also holding, a, um, I believe they're holding a lightning conference in Germany coming up here like next week in Berlin. So kind of sad to miss that, but, um, we'll be eagerly watching and I hope they have a cool live stream. So that's it. Kind of huge news. Very, very happy for it. HRF has proven to be, um, you know, a real leader and uh, backing up their words with their actions in this space for years now. And we're, of course, happy to see our boy CK making moves early on in his career. 
over at HRF. So shout out CK, shout out HRF. All right. Last story of the day. Got a little, little, little gossip going on, a little drama. We've got Dan Held versus Joe Hall. Who's your, who's your pick Q? Uh, Joe's my boy. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I don't really understand Dan's. I mean, this is just value, value judgments and other Bitcoiners and like keyboard warriorism at its worst. Joe Hall's out there spending his time and his, his life really going around the world to places that none of us are ever going to travel to and vetting and supporting Bitcoin circular economies worldwide. I mean, he's been spending a lot of time in Latin America with Paco, you know, otherwise known as run with Bitcoin, going place to place, talking to like every single merchant they can find in, for example, countries like Peru, making videos with them, showing them how to self custody, um, you know, watching merchants come through and use Bitcoin as transactions and just proving to people really um, that one, that there is more that you can be doing to support adoption. You can you can bring whatever it is you're doing in your day to day life. You can bring Bitcoin to the front and center of that thing and you will be kind of supporting option more. Dan Held contends that this is just virtue signaling and Joe is clout seeking. It's very clear to me that he must have never met Joe Hall for some time because he's like the the nicest, most humble, like hilarious dude. And he, uh, you know, he really, you know, fairly newer Bitcoiner, but he's really put his heart and soul into this. And, um, you know, he's a tireless journalist and, you know, has certainly put in more on the ground work than, than Dan from behind his computer. You know what I mean? So I don't. I don't really like the division there. I don't like Bitcoiners attacking Bitcoiners. Dan Held uh, compared Joe to Roger Ver, which, I mean, the comparison didn't really make sense because he was also knocking Roger for all of his insane work as Bitcoin Jesus on the ground, making these, uh, I guess, if you want to call them virtue signally educational videos and showing where in the world Bitcoin was actually being used on a very small scale as a circular economy. I mean, it really doesn't matter who is behind that work or what their intentions are. It's good work. And it really is a great example for the rest of us. You know, it makes me want to orange pill and continue. It gives me new ideas on how to um, approach merchants in my life about this and just, just laying that opportunity out for them, that possibility um, that's mutually beneficial, you know, to the buyer and seller. It seems like Dan's larger argument is that merchant adoption is not important for Bitcoin adoption, um, which is insane I, to me. I, I think, though, I don't agree with Dan's argument at all. I think, I think where he is coming from is more from the angle of, and, and I, I don't agree with this, but the one at a time merchant by merchant isn't as helpful as building a new product that helps mass adoption or at least onboards thousands of people at one time um that's the only only place my brain can go as to why anyone could logically say this because like well he forgot to say that part yeah, he forgot to say that he forgot to say the most important part out loud. Like I'm trying <laughs> to like help him save face a little bit right now. Uh, and I say what that, he's saying is like my my advisory work and my mysterious role at Kraken <laughs> that I've just held nominally for years is more important than you're on the ground convincing people to adopt Bitcoin. Um, I don't know why we're comparing each other. Everyone's here's, you know, bored. I give we're, dude, I give people bored. the benefit of the doubt. It's very clear to me that the intentions are good from Joe and there's no reason to attack him. Like, can you see Dan Held fucking wandering around villages of Peru trying to help people? <laughs> like, no. Dude, if I see Dan very Held few people can anywhere, do that. I don't think he's there to help people. Just. <laughs> oh, man. Shots fired. Shots fired. I don't um, know, man. But, but it's ironic, yeah. too. This is a huge Twitter account that, um, I mean, that's basically it. His contribution is recycled tweets. 
I mean, honestly, I wonder how much of this is just like him being a little salty that Joe gets a lot of love on on the uh, twat box, but Dan just sort of gets roasted pretty consistently. Like you should see some of these group chats that I'm in. Like I honestly, I've just come to realize like it's not that Dan does anything; it's just he exists, so therefore they make fun of him. Well, I mean, let's do a comparison here. Joe Hall has twenty five thousand followers. That's not that many. That's not that much attention. You know, that's an up and comer. But that's it's a, that's a new entry. Po- Dan it's Hell the positive has- attention. It's the positive right. attention. The fact that he's not getting attacked. The fact that he's not looked at in any negative way whatsoever. People don't call him out for stealing tweets, doing Dude, this. And then because he's a good person, <laughs> he's a great guy. I you got Dan, I like Joe. Dan I consider here. Joe a yeah, friend, yeah. even though I've only met him like twice. Like I would, I would look him in the eye and be like, "You're a friend of mine," and I I believe yeah. he would say the same back to me. No, no, no. I think, uh, but just for comparison, Dan's got no, 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 six hundred and seventy-five thousand followers. Wow, Why is Dan he dunking on much? Yes, and it's just from high engagement, kind of pithy tweets that have been recycled for years that excite complete noobs, and also their positions philosophically in Bitcoin are very, very different. Um, I mean, they're both Bitcoiners in their own way, but, you know, Dan's a lot more, you know, from a maximalist conspe- uh, perspective of a, you know, shit corner, let's, let's change Bitcoin, let's bring all the chains to Bitcoin. Um, just been more, I don't know, just a, just a controversial figure, but this is, this is the behavior of kind of unhappy people. I don't I'm not trying to dunk on smaller Bitcoin accounts that are out here doing their best. Yeah. Yeah. What are you, you know? what are you trying to say about accounts with you know less than 10,000 followers? You'll get there. I mean, better luck next bull market, I guess I would say. <laughs> you yeah. Honestly, there are times where I'm like, oh, damn it, I have to go use my NIM account because I can't tweet this from my main handle right now. Like there yeah. is a there's a beauty of having your following so small that you can tweet whatever you want to say yeah for sure i mean that's that's like a difference in strategy right um and the x strategy thing has changed so much like as they kind of continue to fuck up this algorithm um i would just tell people to use noster man you get so much more engagement so much more quickly i mean maybe not to the scale of the dan held and that's why they're not willing to put any skin in the game and that's where it's like what are your incentives here really um, if you're not supporting free and open source communication tech, I mean, the fact that many of these Bitcoiners, they may even have accounts with Noster, but they never fucking use them. It's hilarious to me because it takes you zero extra effort. Making an account is infinitely easier than making an X account. You can automatically cross post between these things. Um, it's just absolutely silly to me. Like the non-support for more freedom tech applications i mean there's only two right now we've got bitcoin and we've got noster and um i don't know man it's Hmm. why'd you stop talking oh he left oh that sucks it's unfortunate um but i think this is a, a great time to just you know point out that most social media is just a psyop trying to control you, get you to waste your time, effort, energy. Um, if Alex decides to come back, we can continue down that rabbit hole. But until then, I will start with our first question of the day. And it is none other than what is a Satoshi? Or more specifically, can you... Huh. I wonder if I'm even live right now. Is there anyone there watching? Okay, yeah, I definitely am. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tino. Um, all right. The first question is despite the fact that oh, there he is. Nice, nice of you to join us. Yeah, sorry, man. Man, that's like that's the first time I haven't been on the stream. I got logged out. I'm not sure what happened. 
It's going to lower my numbers. I think Fair. we're at, what is, this is our 17th episode. This is your 12th, 13th. <laughs> Fuck you. All right. Um, I'm going to start with our first question. Can you explain what a Satoshi is and its significance in Bitcoin transactions? Um, the smallest denomination of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is divided up and it has nine million. Nine decimal places, though. 100 million Satoshis equals, no, eight decimal yeah. places. Eight decimal places. Um, mm-hmm. 100 million Satoshis nine equals digits, though. nine digits. The decimal eight. places, the fun fact is the decimal places are not actually Bitcoin. That's kind of a lens through which we use it. So you could say there are only Satoshis or there are only bits. And the one the one Bitcoin thing is... I don't want to go down the bits or sats rabbit hole with you right now. That, but you have a, to. If you're talking about the essence of what a Satoshi is... A Satoshi is validation that you are in a cult. That's what it is. So what is a rare sat? <laughs> do you subscribe to uh do you subscribe to the rare sat ordinal theory stuff in our room? No. I think everyone who bought bought an ordinal and used the argument, and I'm looking at you, McShane, because I, I watched mm-hmm. you use the argument that no, like we're not like one sat is still equal to one sat. It's fine. Like the fungibility is not ruined because there are so many sats in circulation that you can't actually ruin it because a few of them have inscriptions. That sounds an awful lot. That's not my argument. That's not my argument. I've heard, I've heard that argument on Bitcoin Twitter a lot about how because there are so many sats in circulation, like you can inscribe on however many sats you want and it won't materially affect the value of sats across the entire ecosystem and i call that mm-hmm. a load of horse shit like they literally went to a farm went to the farmer and said okay i know bullshit you sell bullshit but do you have horse shit that you can merge bring them together and then while you're at it give me some pig shit because that's the only logical way that you could actually think that the same argument used by fiat economists that there are so many dollars in circulation it doesn't matter like well it, it just it i mean first of all me. first of all it's important to point out that the interesting about sat the interesting thing about sats is on from one frame, they are fungible, but from another frame, tick, tick, rare stats and all that bullshit aside, they are already not fungible. They, they are unique. Also. Your UTXOs are unique. Your Their creations the are unique. They're created at different times. No, but no, no, so you're. No, 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 but it's not about value. Being That's a not smart what. Ass. Fun... No, but you're being. I'm not smart. being a smart ass. They're, they're both fungible and not. Bitcoin's always been that way. Um, I don't think it's a concern. I'm not worried about it. I mean, I don't think this idea, you know, like miners have tried to implement, you know, kind of green Bitcoins and we've shown that there, there's absolutely no market premium for them that is lasting or has any real impact. I think the same is true of, I think the same is true of rare sats. I mean, I think we're going to see this ordinals kind of ecosystem die out wow. over time, fizzle out, especially as these BRC 20 tokens, with their really clunky, I guess it's like an inscription mechanism. Um, as they reach their full mints, I think we're going to see mempool uh, kind of Bitcoin transaction fees return back to where they would be um, basically without the ecosystem until the next greatest thing, which sounds like it's going to be this runes uh, protocol or thesis. Um, I don't know. It's just it's just fuckery on top of Bitcoin. Whether you subscribe to it or not, there it's you got to admit there clearly is some value there. Maybe not to you, but there are people that value it, um, and you really can't stop what they're doing. Um, but you Nor can, you know, you. Right, no, you can rightly protest it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really care. It's hard to, it's hard to care. Oh, the value of all these things is zero. I mean, the vast majority, if not all of these uh, projects, are completely. Um, they're get rich quick schemes. They're convincing people, you know, uh, actually this is a kind of funny. So 
Binance did a sweep of all the rare sats in customer kind of holdings that they have in custody and replace them in a quote, I guess, uh, comment, common regular sats. I don't know what the nomenclature is, but so you can see these, these filtering mechanisms start to go on exchanges to sweep for these, to try to squeeze some more value and, 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 and scam to get a little, a little bit more Bitcoin out of them. Um, kind of funny to see. Yeah. I mean, ultimately to your point, like all of these projects have some semblance of scams and while each individual scam will eventually go to zero, like the idea of doing this will continue to propagate over time. So the next iteration of this will be slightly different, but it will continue to exist. And I don't see a world where that stops, frankly. Yep. Agree. Uh, so I think to concisely answer the question, Satoshi is Bitcoin. And that uh, justifies its kind of significance in Bitcoin transactions. So when you're the smallest using this like denomination quote, of Bitcoin. Yeah, when you're using this um, smaller denomination of Bitcoin, you're actually using Bitcoin itself. I mean, an entire Bitcoin is somewhat out of reach for most people immediately. So people tend to transact in, you know, smaller unspent transaction outputs, which are just um, aggregations of Satoshis, little groups of sats or bits, whatever, whatever you like to call it. Okay, so next question. How might the integration of smart contracts on the Bitcoin network alter its use cases and competitive standing in the cryptocurrency space? That's kind of a nice transition from what we were just talking about. Are you following any of this uh, RGB stuff? uh drive chains yeah i mean i i think i talked about this with you the other day um look I, i'm gonna simplify this even more i'm a free market maximalist if you want to do something you should have the freedom to do it um and explore it like i should not have the control over another individual of what they want to spend their time effort and energy on that's just what i believe um, that said, I do believe that we are seeing all of these smart contract projects, or at least the, not all, all, all is the, the wrong word, but a significant number of smart contract and shitcoin projects getting served. And so as a result, my concern is you are exposing Bitcoin to the possibility of having regulatory attacks that it has been able to ward off on the simple basis that we can literally say, no, that's something completely different. So that is my concern. That is the large change to Bitcoin that I am worried about. Um, scammers are going to scam shit coins are going to pop up. People are going to try to build the next Bitcoin. People are going to try to digitize everything that is, this trend existed long before bitcoin and it will continue to exist long after bitcoin is global money yeah i think um you know they can go about their business as long as we're not changing bitcoin um on the protocol level so i reject drive chains I don't think RGB needs any uh, changes to Bitcoin to be implemented, so they can have their kind of um, their theories and their their side and uh, you know second and third layers in their heads. Ultimately, it it drives interests and uh, competition in the market, and it brings more people to use the tech. Now, people are all up in arms about how they're using the tech, but regardless it's uh it brings these kind of things do bring um somewhat of a competitive edge and a little bit of a price pump and more market entrance from the crypto ecosystem that would rather house their value on the the mother of all uh cryptocurrencies and an asset that is fundamentally different from all the rest of the cryptocurrencies that is secure and decentralized in reality um you know all the other 20 30 40 i don't know how many thousand alternative cryptocurrencies are dying out there but um 
you know, they, they, they really can't hold a light to Bitcoin. So ultimately, you know, it's hard to say altogether if it's a, if it's a good or a bad thing, it's a complicated thing. It's a nuanced thing, but if it drives more demand for Bitcoin block space, it's, it's hard for me to see how that's altogether bad. It's complicated. Um, okay. So, oh, I think we sort of touched on this already. Can you explain the concept of a UTXO, an unspent transaction output in the Bitcoin network and its role in tracking ownership? Uh, every single time you spin up an address, you create a UTXO. Every time you purchase Bitcoin, it gets associated back to that UTXO, depending on which wallet. Like you, each of us can have multiple UTXOs based on the number of wallets that we've created and based on where we are purchasing our Bitcoin. And we can also link all of our UTXOs together. So your your HD your hierarchical deterministic wallet can generate basically an endless number of receive addresses. The only thing I th think I would correct is that just because you create a new receive address doesn't mean you have ownership of a UTXO. You can spin up hundreds of receive addresses that are empty. Um, but you theoretically you know, would still own the empty address. Right? Yeah, you like have no one else. No the one address, else. But the, ad the address like, is not the UTXO. Right. But to, to be clear, no one else could also spin up their own empty address that is the same address as yours. Like everyone will create their own unique address. This is where it gets interesting. So, in theory, you could have address collision. I wrote an article about this. The odds of it happening are are basically the odds of like pulling two of the same atom out of the universe at once. Like it's it's it, it will never happen, but it could in theory happen where you could have address collision. Um, I need to. I wrote this a few years ago, and it's kind of complicated. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll visit that another day because I don't want to I don't want to misspeak on the technical details. It gets it gets okay. a little gets a little dicey in there. But yeah, um, basically, hold on. What was our question again? UTXOs. The, yeah, it's rolling tracking ownership. So this is kind of where this is kind of where you are putting somewhat of a pseudonymous identity on your Bitcoin. So you have trade off options to consider. You can go the route of Q, which is have a single UTXO with all that contains all of your Bitcoin. So that's one address. All of your receives go to that one address and this thing grows. The advantage of consolidating your UTXOs like that is actually that in the future or even now, relatively high fee rate, but let's say in the future, let's say it costs hundreds of dollars to transact on the main chain. That disincentivizes you from having thousands or hundreds of tiny utxos you know maybe they're maybe you mix them or coin join them into equally small bite-sized chunks of 0.01 bitcoin or 0.1 bitcoin or 0.5 bitcoin um for plausible deniability the greater an anonymity set uh and to yeah to help you stay pseudonymous and to protect your privacy the problem is when you go to spend you're creating a more complicated transaction that's going to use more virtual bytes than a transaction that is just a single UTXO, just depending on the amount you want to spend. So you could have, for example, one transaction that's just 0.02 uh, Bitcoin. And all those, you know, that unspent transaction output is just a single receive address that you're, you're spending from. Or you could have two addresses for 0.01 Bitcoin each. That transaction is going to be, if if sent at the same time, more expensive um, due to the fact that it uses more memory and it's a little bit more complicated to combine the two because you didn't do it previously on the main chain. So I, I hope that makes clear kind of the trade-off there. Um, there. There's no right answer for everyone. Um, some people, I mean, I personally like to coin join Bitcoin. I like to have... Um, 
lots of tiny bits of Bitcoin, but I acknowledge that in the future, it will be more expensive for me to spend that Bitcoin relative to if I had combined it into a single address and then I'm just spending, you know, a way less complicated transaction. Uh, so there's, there's trade-offs there, but it's also important to note that each, you know, your receive addresses are public. You know, the Bitcoin that's held in them is public. It's not necessarily linked to you, but you can make very good probabilistic guesses and arguments based on the movement of your coins, um, you know, between addresses, the froms and the twos. So you have to be very careful to separate these things, especially if you want non-KYC Bitcoin and KYC Bitcoin. And especially if you're going to hold them in the same uh, wallet, you, you have to label those transactions because there's no way you can, there's basically no way you can just remember which Bitcoin is which. Um, so you have to use um, labeling. Um, yeah, super important just for your own privacy. Otherwise, you're basically going to dox your non-KYC Bitcoin uh, through commingling it and spending it with KYC Bitcoin, if that makes sense. So you might wrap up the two different uh, sources into one transaction and now on chain to everyone, you have just shown that regardless of who you are, you do in fact have ownership of at least two addresses, one non-KYC and one KYC. So the KYC uh, UTXO is uh, effectively doxed. Hope that's clear. Uh, I think that's our, our last question for the day. I don't know if you have anything to wrap up with here, Q. Tell us... Oh, oh, we've got a question from from the audience. Tell us a hint of any surprise at Nostrasia, please. Hmm. If you donate enough sats, I'll be there. Yeah, if you donate <laughs> enough sats, Q will be there. So make sure if you're watching from Zap.Stream, send us a little a little tip so we can help Q, uh, Q get a plane ticket out there. Yeah, the sooner surprise. we raise this, the cheaper the ticket is, because otherwise we probably need to raise the the. Yeah, we need to raise the get a two thousand dollar ticket to Japan. Um, well, we just secured a gym to do jujitsu during Nostrasia, so that's exciting. So if you're new, uh, if you've never done jujitsu before, we have a very beginner friendly classes going on for a couple of days, um, potentially during, but specifically in the days following the conference. So. I would presume if you're coming all the way to Japan, you know, I hope you're not just hanging out for two days, you know, take a week for yourself, enjoy it, enjoy Tokyo and come hang out with me. We can, uh, you know, roll around the gym, get some good exercise in, learn some self-defense. It's going to be super fun. I'm actually bringing my uh, sensei and coach from uh, uh, from out here stateside to come teach and just just enjoy. And he's a black belt, super high level AOC, you know, competitive uh, oh, nice. Bitcoin. He knows AOC. <laughs> Not that AOC. Excuse me. Did I say AOC? AOJ. Yes. You said so it's a big, big jujitsu gym. I said AOC. Yeah. Always on my mind. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I guess that's one little surprise. We can roll out some more here. We're going to release the agenda. I'm targeting October 1st. So get ready. We'll release the Nostrasia agenda soon. It's pretty much tightened up. It's pretty full. If you want to speak at this conference or host a workshop, please DM me immediately so that we don't you know, run out of time and we can host your content. It's not a guarantee we'll do everything, but for the most part, we're really, we're really open to anything. So we'd be excited to have you there if you've got a great idea. Um, yeah, Snowden's coming. That's exciting. Talking to the uh, Assanges, see if Stella and Gabriel want to come out as well. And uh, Luke Rutkowski from We Are Change. These are people who are newer to Noster, but we want to educate them, get them on the side of light and good here and get them on the protocol. So we'll see what happens. That's my update. And that's all I have time for today, guys. Uh, join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Please give us a follow on Rumble if you're watching from YouTube. Um, definitely smash the like button and uh give us a follow there everything helps thank you for everyone tuning in from zap.stream by far and away our favorite platform 
And uh, yeah, you guys are the most fun and encouraging every morning. So really appreciate that. And uh, that's a wrap.